Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, thanks to the organizers for this workshop. It's been fantastic uh, listening to all the talks. Um, I, I've got a, a, a little bit of an easy task because uh, survival extrapolation has been talked about by Chris and Daniel in the previous uh, couple of talks. So I, I don't need to go through all the background again. Um, but I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, a post estimation command called Stanser, which is embedded in the FlexServe package. Um, and how we can use this post estimation command to do survival extrapolation. Um, and particularly, I'm going to be talking about excess hazards models um, and the, some, some of the potential benefits of using an excess hazard model. So I'd like to thank very much Chris, Chris Jackson, um, firstly, for allowing this kind of functionality, this Stanser functionality to be embedded in Flexer, um, and also for uh, the fantastic package that he's written. A lot of the, the commands that Stanser are really just wrapper functions around Chris's prediction tools. Um, and I'd also uh, need to acknowledge Paul Lambert uh, from the University of Leicester and Karolinska Institute, who has written uh, a Stanserve command for Stata, and which I've shamelessly uh, borrowed a lot of the, the kind of functionality and translated it to R. So as I said, there's, the background probably um, doesn't need to be gone, go into too much, and um, really, I'm talking about the setting maybe when we have a, 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 a cancer clinical trial uh, and we might have an overall survival curve that we want to extrapolate. And often uh, the, the all cause mortality is modeled using standard parametric distributions. And then uh, those are used to extrapolate into the future to the time horizon of interest. Uh, and the problem with that, of course, is that we get widely discordant extrapolations, as many people uh, may have experienced, depending on which parametric survival model we choose. Um, but can we do better? Can we actually incorporate background mortality rates into the actual estimation of our parametric model? And that's what these kind of excess hazard models do. They allow us to incorporate background mortality rates into the estimation. So what we actually end up estimating is the excess hazard rather than the all-cause hazard. Um, and one of the and that those kind of models uh, exist and have existed in Flexer for a while. But one of the kind of uh, challenges then is how do we predict from them and how do we predict back overall survival from those types of models? So this kind of Stanserve, which stands for standardized survival, is uh, kind of like a, an open sourced R solution which allows us to fit and predict from excess hazard models. Um, of course, if you want to be very Bayesian and bring in lots of external information, then I think, you know, Chris has shown a very neat way of doing that with his, his new package. But this is a, a, a frequentist kind of implementation of excess hazard models. So briefly, these are basically models, excess hazard models and models that partition our all cause survival into two parts. The expected hazard, which is um, often taken from population life tables, and the excess hazard. And it's the excess that we're modeling. Uh, so graphically, what we have here, uh, the green line is our all cause mortality rate, which may be increasing during the trial and may start to decrease towards the end of the trial. This is just an example. Um, and then after a period of time, our all cause rates might come back towards the general population rates, which are shown here in red. Uh, and the blue line is the excess. So it's just the, the difference between the two. Uh, this is an example here of a, what's called a, a cure model because our all cause mortality rates are coming back towards and converging to the general population rates over time. So one reason we might want to use these types of models is that the excess hazard function is a simpler function. It's only got one turning point in this example, and therefore may be easier to extrapolate. It also, we also might want to use these models because it enforces, it forces our uh, all-cause mortality to always be above the general population rates. 
So they never go down below because the excess hazards can't be negative. So to fit these models, um, in practice, what we need is a life total, right? So we can get the expected mortality rates um, and those go into the model as, as if they were offsets. Um, so we can merge in expected rates from a life table, usually using matching variables that are in the life table, such as age, calendar year, and sex. And we merge to each individual in our study um, based on the expected rates at that individual's event time. And that's all we need to actually fit the model, and we can do that with FlexServe. If we want to predict an all-cause survival from that model, we need to now bring in the expected survival for an individual. We multiply that by what's known as the relative survival function. That's something that comes from the excess hazards model directly. So if it's a Weibull, then the relative survival is a Weibull survival distribution. Uh, so we need to combine those two things together. Um, Luckily, we can get these individual expected survivals uh, from a package in, in the survival package in R called Servex. Um, but those uh, are, are slightly difficult to calculate. So we have to sum up all the individual hazards between zero and T. And then we also have to think about what happens if we're projecting beyond the range of the life table. And so there's some usually some defaults there about using the maximum age if you have wanted to predict it for ages greater than that and the maximum calendar year, for example. And then finally, what we end up with actually prediction, individual specific predictions, because often there's covariates in the, in the life table. So they're going to depend on an individual's age, they're going to depend on the individual's sex and year. So the next and final step really is to marginalize them or average these predictions. So we end up with marginal survival curves. So there's a few steps there, but the good news is that all this is really implemented using Stanser. That's what it's, it's there for. It's there to get standardized survival, average survival curves. There's a vignette um, on the CRAN website in the FlexServe package for anyone interested to read more about Stanser. So this is really just the schematic. Uh, this may help things um, a bit better. So here we've got our trial data. We, we can choose uh, a parametric model of our, our choice. So if we want to use a YB or a Gompertz, Gamma, whatever, we can use FlexServe Reg. If we're interested in mixture models, we can use FlexServe Mix, FlexServe Cure for cure-based models, mixture models. There's also flexor spline we can use if we're interested in uh, flexible parametric models. To fit the excess hazard model, we have to bring in the GPM rates at the event time from the life table. So there has to be a, a little bit of data manipulation to merge those in with our data set. But then we end up with par parameter estimates of, um, for the excess hazards. So those might be hazard ratios, there might be shape and scale parameters. And then to get the predictions, this is where Stanserve comes in. Again, we use the life table to get expected survivals for each individual. And then Stanserve averages all these things together. So these are the features really of Stanserve. We get marginal survival, hazard, restricted mean survival metrics. We can also get the expected survivals population level that we match to our study population. We can do this either standard parametric models or in the excess hazard framework. And nicely, it gives you contrast as well. So differences in marginal restricted mean survival or marginal hazard ratios. Uh, and finally, all the kind of confidence intervals and standard errors for all the measures and the contrasts that use either delta method or bootstrapping. So this is a, a bit of a case study of it from the action. Um, there's some data wrangling parts, which I've left out. Uh, you can go on the GitHub site here or just scan this QR code. That will take you to the same place. 
and that will uh, let you follow through the code at your leisure. So I'm using basically the German breast cancer data set, which is a data set that's available in many R packages. The, the one I'm using here is from a package called Conserve because it's got a few more uh, covariates and information in it. So after a bit of data wrangling, what we need to do is merge in the life table. Um, and here, I'm just using the US life table that comes with the survival package. But in general, you can get any life table you want from the human mortality database. In fact, you can get R to talk to the human mortality database and bring it down automatically. Um, they usually come in, in a form of what's called a rate table. So then we might want to transform it to a data frame. That's what this kind of bit of code does. And then we want to join it together with our actual data set. So we do a kind of join by age, sex, and year. Our kind of data set looks a bit like what's in the top right here. We have a, a row for each individual, survival times, a sensor and indicator. Here we've got a covariate, um, which is just grade of disease and the expected rates from the life table at each individual's event time. Now, to fit the models, it's very similar. If you, if you know FlexServe, all you're doing now is adding this extra command, B hazard, which brings in the expected rates. So this first model is just a, a, a Weibull, proportional excess hazards model. And the second model here is a cure model. So we can use FlexServe cure. And we're going to allow here just the, the grade of uh, the cancer to be to affect both the cure proportion and the uh, the the survival in the uncured. Um, so I won't go too much into the cure models, but uh, the key thing with these cure models is they allow the excess hazards to tend towards zero part of time. Okay, and this is the kind of syntax for Stanser. So this, this is now when we fitted our model, we can get the predictions. We have to give it the fitted model. We tell it what the prediction we want. In this case, it's survival, all cause survival. We tell it what the time points we want. And we tell it what we want, what groups we want to predict for. So this at command, which I'll go into a little bit more detail in a minute, you can make it as long as you want, and you make as predictions for each uh, each uh, covariate pattern. Um, that you're specifying. And then finally, if we're predicting from an excess hazards model, we need to bring back in the, the, the rate table, the life table that we're using and how we match it to our data set. So that's, that's syntax is kind of like um, pretty generic, but once you've got that, you can get out all the predictions either as a data frame or we can just plot them. So this is a plot. You can use expected equals true that then plots the expected survival. You can use confidence intervals equals true to get out confidence intervals. Um, it's also a GG plot object, so you can add additional things onto it quite easily. So here I'm just adding a step function, which is the Kaplan Meyer data. If we wanted the hazards out instead, we just do type equals hazard. This gives us our all cause hazards functions. And we can see this is actually a cure model. So we can see our all cause hazards are coming back down towards the expected rates after a period of time. And then if we do type equals RMST, we get out the restricted mean survival times. And here, this is just shown as the data frame. We've got it uh, for our two groups we want to predict for the grade one, two, and the grade equals three, so it gives us two predictions for those two groups, and it also gives us the difference in restricted mean survival. So that's contrast equals difference, gives us a difference. So just very briefly, just this at statement is quite uh, important. It allows the user to specify a list of scenarios in which specific covariates are fixed to certain values. And then any other covariates in our model, which we may have other covariates, might like have age in that there, any other covariates are averaged over. So this is often called regression standardization, and it's used a lot in causal inference. So there's some causal inference kind of interpretations here. So it gives us the, 
the, cal the, the opportunity to calculate uh, potential outcome means and counterfactual contrasts. So if everyone had been assigned treatment versus if everyone had been assigned control, you'd, you'd say you'd, you'd use that at statement. So there's some powerful kind of uh, counterfactual kind of methodology going on here as well, where you assign people to certain treatments. So just to conclude then, these kind of excess hazard models, um, they can provide a statistically coherent way to incorporate the general population mortality rates. We're, we've written a kind of tutorial on this, which is currently under review in medical decision-making. So that should be out uh, fairly soon. In fact, it's just been accepted yesterday. Um, they, these models do ensure the predicted rates never drop below the background rates. So if you're worried about those kind of things with your extrapolations, then these kind of models are useful in that sense. You can bring in cure models. That allows the excess hazards to tend to zero over time. It's a strong assumption, but if you're willing to make that assumption, that's what those cure models will do. Um, the standard basically allows you to provide this kind of predictions of all the quantiles and metrics that you wish. Uh, I will just point out the last point. These models aren't a panacea. They can still result in quite implausible extrapolations if our excess hazards are going a lot higher than the background rates. So if we're extrapolating a parametric model, like say a GOMPERS, which has got an in exponentially increasing hazard, then these will still give quite implausible uh, projections. So we still have to use common sense when looking at these different models. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Michael, I just want to open the floor for questions. Uh, Howard. Thanks, Mike. Really interesting to see. Um, have you considered the application to the case where you might have a long term registry on the baseline hazard for one treatment, but then you'd have a meta analysis or a network meta analysis giving you hazard ratios for a new, new intervention and then using that for the extrapolation? Because now your excess hazard model, you put a restriction that the excess hazard has to be positive, whereas the hazard ratio for a new treatment will be, would you give you a negative excess hazard? Well, the, the absolute excess hazard has to be positive, yes. But um, I suppose when you talk about treatment effects, you could bring in, for example, treatment effects from meta-analysis, as you say. Um, this... I mean, the flexor doesn't necessarily allow you to bring in external data sources in a, like a meta analytic way. I suppose Christmas package we heard before lunch could do that. Um, but yes, it, it, the, the key assumption of these excess hazard models is that that excess hazard never drops below the population hazard. So it's always going to be it's always going to be positive. Yeah. So it's not directly applicable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, um, does it have to be background mortality that you use? Because I can see one media application here is treatment waiting, where um, if you sort of say you've got an extrapolation for one, you're on a treatment for a period of time, but the uh, effect will go away at 15, 20 years. Well, actually, if, you could, if that can be set as a reference curve rather than the general population, then I think that would be another application unless you found me otherwise. I, I, it's a really good question. I, th I, I don't think it does have to necessarily be background mortality rates. Um, what you could bring in data sources, you know, from registries if you if you felt that that was where you wouldn't want your 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 trial data to go below. Um, it, it depends what you what what you wanted your your background rates to be. So if you wanted it to be general population mortality, then the excess has a different interpretation than if you were allowing those background rates to be a cancer registry, for example. But yes, you, I think they could be other sources of data. There's a question in the chat. Well.
the, the question is uh, from Kate Wren. Uh, how useful is this approach to extrapolate trial data? I, I think generally it's, it's, it's very useful because our trial data is, is uh, only limited in its follow-up. So we have this issue all the time of parametric models um, that give very different projections if we don't bring in other external data. So this is one way of bringing in external data in terms of population mortality rates to help with those projections. Uh, and and it, it, explicitly, they, they just mean that those projections never drop below the population rates. Brilliant. I think we'll have to, to leave it there because of time, but uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael.